So, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, I believe one of the first things you did in Smoky Mountain, uh, you were a henchman for him. I don't know if you're under a mask or or whatnot, yeah. but talk about Jake in 1993. Uh, I know you saw him in the Australia tour and then yeah. Smoky as well. Yeah, just um, actually an Australian tour. The um, the first day we were there, uh, some guys went to the uh, promos for Hard Rock Cafe, and then some of us got to, had to go to a gym uh, to do some just sparring and stuff. And then a couple guys were running late, uh, Jake Roberts being one of them, uh, due to flights, not because of, of being Jake. But um, so the in in the, the one of the last days of the tour they you had a choice to go to a zoo or you can go back to hard rock and jake myself and my tag team partner tom rico uh in a driver and then he had an escort or whatever groupie whatever pretty much followed him around we went to the hard rock and uh man we just he picked up everyone's dinner tab and you know um like I says he was making a lot of shitload of money off those polaroids back then too and we went to you know pay and he's like just tell them kids to keep buying my polaroids you know and that's pretty cool uh, um, you know, like I said, I talked to him on a, you know, not on a nightly basis. If we were on the same bus, we spoke or what have you, but Smoky Mountain, I had been there a while and, um, uh, Tim Horner was doing the, uh, going to be Kendo, the, the ninja. And, um, I guess he was going to be Jake's henchman. And that's when I guess they had a falling out with Jimmy and, um, Tim, I guess that's one, what, or the last one, one of them. And Jimmy called me and said, Hey, would you want to come in and do TV? Um, you know, I need someone here. Like, and I'd been off TV for a couple of weeks and I was like, yeah, sure. And so I was Jake's henchman. I think we shot three TVs with me as his henchman. Um, you know, and I just, uh, you know, had the whole gimmick, you know, and we shot a couple angles. I went out and did a job for Tracy and then Jake interfered. And then I interfered with Jake's match with white boy and this and that, but I was going to carry the snake, you know, but there was never a snake in a fucking bag. And then the, uh, the big night, uh, was going to be in Knoxville was, was, uh, I was going to, uh, carry the bag out snake, uh, with, uh, um, and you've heard this from before from Cornette, I'm sure. And I remember it just like it's fucking yesterday, uh, against white boy. But, um, so that same particular night in, in, uh, Knoxville, uh, might have heard a guy named Michael Jordan. He was playing baseball over in Alabama. Well, they were in his – that minor league team was in town for the, uh, the, the, the the Knoxville Smokies baseball team affiliate. And not only that, it was a fucking night the OJ thing was going <laughs> on. So we, everyone – there was no one in the Coliseum. You know, I mean, it was just – it was just so that was my last night doing it because um one i couldn't i i, I couldn't my my ex-wife uh if she took me to the, if we took to the towns together um she could sell my gimmicks and stuff you know and i'd make my trans and what have you and um so when that night took place and of course I couldn't sell any trans and blah, blah, blah. And I had already done those TVs. I couldn't sell gimmicks during that match because I had to park my car away from the building, drive by myself. Didn't want to see my wife in the business. Well, then where's Bobby at? He's the one under the hood, you know? So trying to, you know, everyone's, you can't, you know, say they're not stupid. So, um, with, <laughs> I did, I did another shot as Kendall about 30 minutes from my house, um, a couple of times and that was already booked and that was close enough that I was, when I, when I got done, I, I, one Saturday rolled around, I called Jimmy and, uh, I said, Jimmy, I'm, I'm done being Kendo. I said, man, I, you know, he, he upped my pay a little bit to kind of make up for it, but it, I mean, it wasn't enough to, wasn't any heat or anything. I was just like, he goes, don't worry. I've got someone else in mind. I'll do it for $25 cheaper. <laughs> and uh, I won't mention that person, but I was like, yeah, that's cool. I said, when you need me back as Bobby blaze, let me know. Cause I'm available, you know, and like, but uh, yeah, I got to be Jake's henchman, but it wasn't very long because of course, Jake no showed also. So, so it was one of those things where it just, um, uh, they kept the kendo gimmick for a while longer, but it wasn't me after that. It, it was Horner, then me, and then someone else. So, did he? Um, was it was it that show at the Coliseum that he no showed? And was there ever going to be a snake pit match? Did Jim ever talk to you about the snake pit match about having the no, ring surrounded by no, that? I, I didn't get. I just filled in, like I said, as that kendo for just that short period, and then um, 
you know, that, that was that. I just remember being being in the Civic Coliseum at night and there's no no crowd and everyone like watching OJ. I mean, how I got out of matches and went back and watched OJ, you know, hotel room, whatever. But yeah, um, that's the best of my recollection. The uh, recollection, the uh, didn't get to do a whole lot with them. Went out to the match with them on one TV. Like I said, I'd, I'd done a job for Tracy. I interfered and then, then Jake interfered and then, like I said, a couple weeks later, went to the house show, and that was that. Yeah. He no showed, and you're sitting there going, "Well, whatever." You know, I mean, <laughs> Jake's Jake. Mm. So it's it's always I don't fo- know. It's always a folly, isn't it, when you're hiring Jake? Uh, also, you've got to watch. I'm sure you have, but the Last Dance, what an amazing series that was on Netflix. You know, the uh, Michael Jordan documentary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, that was an absolutely. amazing documentary. Um, yes. You had an extended program with Dirty White Boy. Uh, you've got to talk about yeah. Tony Anthony for me. Uh, how was he as a character? And Dirty White Girl as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was my first program. Really, that Jimmy was going to have me come in and do uh, pretty much no quit kid. Um, I could take it, you know, kind of one of those things again, not backing down from Tony, you know, at the very beginning. And so uh, we set up these matches where. And Tony was good to me um, until I got the heavyweight title. And that's a whole different story. And that's a couple of years down the line. But at the beginning, um, the, uh, and he wasn't bad to me then. I'm just saying there was a conflict, not tell you. But uh, no, at the beginning, he could, um, we'd have the match. It'd be either a 15 or 20 minute match, depending on the card where we're at, um, usually first or second match. And he could pin me as many times as he could during that time, as long as I didn't quit. And I just had to pin him one time. So, you know, he'd get a bunch of moves in, then pin me, and I'd fight back, you know, and then somewhere in there I'd give him a nut shot, and he'd go down, and I'd go and do a big move, but he'd outsmart me one more time, and, you know, uh, then the time limit would go off. So he'd maybe win two or three matches, pin me two or three times throughout the match, but the match would be a draw or I'd win because I made it to the time limit stipulation. So, uh, yeah, and Tony was easy to work with. Um at the beginning, I don't think he liked it. I, I, I think Candido was working with Horner, and I was working with White Boy, and I think they felt like, oh, you know, these young guys are coming in, you know, and taking their spots, but that wasn't it at all. We were just coming in. We were young and full of piss and vinegar and ready to work, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, then with the Smoky Mountain title, I think Tony, where he lived in Knoxville and stuff, he may have thought at times that, you know, that's my title. You know, um, I'm the Smoky Mountain champion. You know, I'm not going to leave Knoxville or whatever. Well, um, you know, when I'd done that angle with them, um, of course, everyone was very professional. So Lawler, uh, you know, got, got over in Lawler and Landell, but then White Boy's going to kind of be my, kind of watch my back kind of thing. And so a couple of times, you know, he'd say something like, you know, you know, that's my belt, don't you? And I'm like, it's fucking whoever Jimmy Cornette says it is, you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd rib him back. I'd rib him. And, 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 and if I said it the, the wrong way, like once my said, said, I'm not saying I said, I just said something like smart ass. I said, well, there's the belt. There's the ring. If you want it, go and get it. I, yeah, that's all I can tell you. This was like during the gimmick table, right? And uh, he goes, hey, hey, lighten up, man. I'm just ribbing. I go, well, I didn't take it the rib because you you keep mentioning that, you know, several times now. And uh, he goes, no, I, I get it, you know. And, and he did. He, you know, it was, there was no heat. It was just like I was tired of hearing it kind of thing, you know. And he was like cool with it. But um, I liked working with Tony. Uh, I uh, at first, he wasn't giving me a lot during those matches, uh, just eating me up pretty much. And I thought that was my job was a sell. And um, come so what happened was, and this is where I, again, knew they had bigger plans for me because of Ricky and Robert. Uh, Robert and I roomed together one night, and we had been several nights. He goes, I think Tony needs to give you more. Um, you need to take a little bit more, be more aggressive. And uh, I'm going to talk to Jimmy tomorrow. And I said, and Tony, I said, well, I'd appreciate it. I said, but is that cool? He said, yeah. He said, I think if you'd done this and got a little bit more offense in, it would go over better. The next day, Tony gave me more. And obviously, I talked to both of them. I thanked Robert because it was true. Um, and it worked better. And I think Tony saw that. Okay, don't have to eat the kid up. Let him have a little more. I'm actually beating someone. And then also, um, Ricky Morton came to me. Uh, again, John C. Tennessee said, Bobby, watch how I sell tonight, especially watch how I sell. This is working from the bottom. You, you're working your way up and, um, you know, you, he's on top of you. And so, of course, I had been watching an Indian boy up in Canada sell. I learned from him, uh, Soaring Eagle. 
and I pretty much knew how to sell. But then you got Ricky Morton, the fucking king of all sellers out there, and he's and that sound like Cornette has told him to tell me stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because he's in the other locker room, and so yeah, I smartened up that way. But Tony was easy, fun. Um, first big program I'd done with them, uh, beat the TV champ, uh, got the big check, you know, and pissed him off that much more and started a good little program, built me up. And then on the other side, uh, uh, Horner was building up Candido for me and, uh, for when Candido and I got together, it was going to mean something, you know? So yeah, no, no problems there, man. Um, hope Tony's doing well. I heard he had an appearance somewhere, but I don't know if that's true or not. I hope it is. Hope he gets hmm. out some more. People need to see, you know, some of these guys. Um, but yeah. And, yeah. and I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I sold some gimmicks and um, uh, he had gotten a boat and um, I went to the locker room and I handed him about 30 bucks. So he got on a boat uh, on that weekend. I said, get you some gas money for your boat. And he, he really popped for that. Um, I've done that a couple of times. I think I gave him 30 one time and 15 one time, you know, just, just, to, just to do it. Uh, no one told me to, I heard him talking about his boat. I knew I'd done really good at the gimmick tables. I didn't cut it in my check. And, uh, I think that, um, I think that kind of broke some ice too. Cause he's like, Oh, okay. This kid is not just some, you know, just some dummy. He's, he's catching on to the whole program deal. Yeah. And I didn't do it to be bragging or boastful, nothing, but I had also seen Tracy do it. I knew rock and roll had, you know, done it. I giving people some gimmick money, you know? So yeah, kind of karma, what goes around comes around. You put that good karma out there, you know, that's all it was. Yeah. One good turn deserves another. Um, just staying, exactly. uh, just staying on um, Tony Anthony. Uh, and this is actually going uh, further on. So um, 99, well, the end of 95, uh, Jim Cornette's shut smoky goes to WWF to work in an office position. And over the next maybe year or so, he starts bringing in some people from Smokey. Mm -hmm. And um, the most obvious one to mention is Tony Anthony. And then yeah. he's given a plumber gimmick. He is <laughs> he he's eaten up immediately and then spat out, basically. He's, he's, not, done right, he's not been done right yeah. by, basically. Was this ever in your thinking um, as far as when you went to WCW? We, I mean, you, you obviously made the right choice because it was guaranteed money. You were there for several years. Um, was there any um, point where Jim Cornette was trying to bring you into the WWF and trying to make you into, um, a, a, I don't know, a producer of leather or just some yeah. weird, stupid character or, you know, a circus clown or whatever else? Actually, I got away from out here's how. Um, when Smoky Mountain shut down, I had already been talking to Kevin Sullivan. And Kevin Sullivan put me in touch with Paul Orndorff. And so I had been speaking to those men. Um, in fact, I would have already done a TV had it not been, and it was Paul and I was speaking on the phone, had it not been, he thought I was still in Knoxville and I was, and I was eight hours, I was four hours away from Knoxville. And um, he said, well, you're right in Knoxville. You, you can make Atlanta in four hours. I'm like, well, Paul, I'm actually going to make in Georgia, which is another hour or so past Atlanta. And he didn't realize that I wasn't in Knoxville. And so that kind of ignited there, but it, it started in negotiations. But yeah, Jimmy called me and uh, we had a nice conversation. Um, he wanted me to go to Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he offered me to uh didn't want me to go. It offered me the situation to go to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is a couple hours from my house and Huntington, West Virginia, which is again, like 20 miles from house, two TV tapings, $300 per night guaranteed at $600. And I said, you know, Hey Jimmy, and I needed $600. This is shortly, you know, I shut down right, right before Christmas there that year. Um, so I, I was like, well, one, I didn't want the, the money, but I was also, I said, Jimmy, you know, here's the thing. I said, will I be going over? I doubt that, but do, do you know, having, what, what will I be doing? He goes, Bobby, he goes, I have no control over it. He said, you could, you could be booked against Al Snow or Marty Janetti and tear the house down, or they could put you against Sid and he'd just eat you up. He said, I have no control over that. I'm just asking if you want the bookings. And of course, off of that, we saw what happened with Tony and Tracy. And, you know, so I think, you know, being, being that I was there, if they'd have seen me that way, I could have gotten one of those positions as well. I actually went up when they came to Huntington, I went up and I saw Jimmy and Tammy and, and Chris and some of the crew that was working there, et cetera, uh, because they're friends of mine, but I didn't work it because my answer to Jimmy was, I said, Jimmy, I said, I'm actually, because the reason I asked, I said, I can't go on that TV and get beat because I'm talking to WCW. And Jimmy goes, who are you speaking to in WCW? And I said, Paul Orndorff. He goes, go to Atlanta, Bobby, listen to what Paul tells you. He goes, Paul's a straight shooter. 
And um, so Paul had already told me some things and I was like, okay. I said, then my decision is I won't be there at those dates. So I sock him up and see you if you don't care. He's like, yeah, yeah, we're busy in the back, but please stop by, you know, whatever. So I, that's how I kind of escaped that. And um, it, it held true. That was the right move for me to make. Um, it took another tour of Japan uh, for Terry Taylor to finally call me back, but, but it, but it all worked out, you know, that's how I got around all that and got a guaranteed contract out of it, like you said, and, and it, it worked out for the best. So. Yeah. Did, um, did you ever have any idea of what your character might have been if it was up to you, assuming that uh, it was in the occupational mold? <laughs> oh man um well they had already done the teacher thing they'd already done the coach thing uh trying to think if i was wasn't a plumber ah fuck maybe i don't know would they have given me an electrician deal <laughs> I don't, you know they've had garbage men they've you know they've had about every i don't have any idea man uh, <laughs> that's right electrician tyler roofer <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the old Mitch Hedberg joke. Yeah, I was a hot tar roofer. I remember that day. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I was never a roofer. Um, I don't know, man, what they would have given me. Um, hell, carpenter. You know, double and in you know double there. He's a good carpenter. I'm out there making our town look good. So you know, I come to do a good job. I'll lay the foundation for your house, and also, um, I had installed carpets in people's houses before in Florida <laughs> so I could come out there with my knee pads on and my little gimmick I guess a carpenter I don't know <laughs> if, uh, you were, if you were a carpenter eventually he would have said all right you've got long hair already grow a beard and then it'd somehow morph into a Jesus character I'm I knew sure. what you were going to say <laughs> I knew, I said, when you said that I'm like oh no I don't know man I'm no kind of a, a, a messiah you know I'd be a fucking lost messiah out there uh, maybe you know leading people astray um, taking a sheep the opposite direction <laughs> plus you can't have Jesus lose as well or else I, I mean right, it'd be a man. heck of a comeback yeah well apparently he made one so yeah i oh, know like, <laughs> it was a well-established comeback but it was a, it was a short yeah. it was a short second run i believe yeah. uh, um i'll move on then and you've mentioned uh, a couple of times <laughs> chris candido uh and it was for yep. the light heavyweight championship wasn't it that yep. unfortunately didn't really the junior last, heavyweight the junior excuse me it didn't really last very long did it, it was a few months but yeah. and it traded only between you and chris but tell me what chris was like and we both sp spoke to johnny johnny recently as yeah. well um, Chris was great. He was, he's young kid, uh, excited, full of piss of vinegar, loved, loved, loved the business had actually came over, uh, before he started, he came over from Memphis. He had a Sunday afternoon off and he came over, um, you know, all the way across the state there and, uh, met me over at Knoxville and sit in the back and talked to him and told me, he's excuse me, excited about coming in and that we'd be working a program together, which Jimmy had already told me, I've got this young boy I want you to, you'll be working with. I've got something in mind for you. And I thought that was very professional uh, to, to, to do that, you know, to, to take a time of his day off. And uh, he showed me his last pay stub in Memphis that was written down, and I, it was laughable. And he goes, man, I can't wait to get out of here, but I've got like two weeks left. And, you know, so, um, again, just um, when I met him, he was young and um, – we, we gelled a lot on a lot of the ways, you know, okay, we want to try to do this. Uh, I know I can do these things. You can do these things. And I thought we worked really, really well together. Uh, both of us being athletic and very mobile. Um, yeah. Um, and I like Chris personally because he loved the business so much. We had traveled a few times together. Um, other than him calling home and talking to Tammy because no cell phone then, but being in a hotel room going like, God, well, two hours you're over there on the phone you know i'm just watching tv let's go eat or we got back from meeting i've got caught tammy you know kind of thing but that's that's his deal i get it but um in between those times we just talking about wrestling we just talking you know old timers we talk about matches we had seen matches we had had uh japan we hadn't been there yet but the magazines you know like we want to go one day just all that you know um and, and i think chris had a good heart you know he he um he wasn't, I'd never seen him being mean to anyone, you know, not like that. He wasn't certainly ever mean with me or anything. Always uh, like, even at time, um, I was talking about going up to the civic center and, 
and not taking the TV tapings, but I, I ran into Tammy first, and then he come around a corner, and right in front of everyone, a lot of the boys are like, Bobby Blaze, my favorite opponent, you know, come up, gave me a hug, you know, and whether I was or what, and I was probably at that time, but, um, you know, it makes you feel good, and um, yeah, so... I was, I was sad when he passed that that's why I said yeah uh, when I was talking to Johnny the Tracy one uh Tracy's death that really plays on me a little bit because um of that tie-in actually but Tr Chris was one of the first people in the business that I lost that I was really like I was real close to the guy um you know uh, and at that point he never partied we never had a beer together you know nothing like that um just all young and innocent you know back then for him so uh, maybe even naive to a point, you know. Was so. was he um, when he got to Smoky Mountain? Because he was wrestling for actually a few years before he got to Smoky. Uh, was he yeah. pretty much the complete package by the time he arrived there, or were you yeah. leading him by the he, hand still, or was he just one of those natural I, talents? I had to I had to slow him down sometimes, <laughs> you know, um, because of my wrestling background. I would, I would have to take him down and say, you know, I know the, it's kind of like Cornette talks about. I guess he'd done a, a big crazy bump or something, some town and got no reaction. The next day he went over and kicked the, uh, the, the stairs and got the reaction. Same thing in a ring. I'd have to, I'd have to legitimately take him down in a hold and hold him down, whether it be a hammer lock or a front face lock, uh, no way being disrespectful or hurting him, but saying, Chris, slow down. This is not the pace. Excuse me. Um, it, it, because he'd be wanting to go on to the next, you know, next mover spot. So um, being from this area and, and, and knowing the pace, um, a couple of times I had just, you know, nothing bad or mean. i just take him down and hold him and say, slow down. And he would. He would. And he, and he understood that, you know. Um, you didn't have to rush right into the next spot. But for the most part, man, uh, he knew what he wanted to do. He knew how to do it. And um, unbelievably strong and very, very easy to work with. Like I said, when I took them down, it wasn't hard because we were working together. It's not like I was shooting them. I mean, I just took them down like easy going, Chris, slow down. We'll build it back up. So it wasn't like I was like, you know, trying to do it. I don't think, um, I don't think it was because he was trying to be um, ahead of me. I think it's because he really thought you had to go this fast, you know. So, yeah, but yeah, he, I won't say he was completely polished, but he damn sure was close to it. I'll say that. Yeah. Diamond in the rough. Definitely. Yes, um, absolutely. I knew I was working with someone talented every time I stepped in the ring with them. Hmm. I do know that, you know, yeah. that it, it, it my, he's my favorite fucking opponent right there, man. Hmm. Um, I love matches with Chris, you know. Uh, I have to ask you this because and uh, not only because it seems that uh, two of the top three videos on my YouTube channel uh, feature Tammy Sitch. Uh, but it, uh, memories of Tammy Sitch. I actually asked Dr. Tom, and I said, was she always a nightmare or only when she got to the <laughs> WWF? And he's like, always, always a nightmare. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I tell people I knew Tammy before tits and with tits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <so> <laughs> um, when I met her, man, she's this little young 21-year-old girl. Um, I saw certain things, and you know, you'd you gotta be quiet about. And I'm like, yeah, you kind of know something's going on, but, um, I didn't personally have any problems with her because I didn't, um, didn't interact with her a whole lot. Uh, a couple of times when I was doing the kendo thing, I'd be in a locker room in the hillside and, you know, so I'd, you know, be around her there. Um, I had went through a home and or the apartment and eating dinner a couple of times with them. Um, you know, she, uh, she wasn't a problem for me because I sometimes I think you teach people how to treat you and I never let her treat me in a disrespectful way. I was a little bit older and, um, uh, I try to be, I try to be professional to her in, in a manner that, you know, um, I respect for Chris, this is where the line's drawn, you know? So, um, now I know a lot of other things about her and, but, it, you know, just like in my first book there, um, if I, I didn't go in there and, and write and shit on people, you know what I'm saying? So I don't want to be the one, um, to shit on her and, and, um, uh, kind of, if I knew someone's doing drugs, well, that's their fucking issue. That's their problem. I'm not going to be one talking trash about it or writing about it. Same thing with affairs. If I knew guys were 
fucking around or what it's not my place to go and tell the wives or nothing like that you know i'm not i'm not gonna snitch them out or stooge them out so i certain things i saw about her and knew about her were you know that's their deal not mine mm. uh i'm not gonna be the one to fuck it up so is, yeah. is there something at least slightly admirable is uh I'll, i know jim Cornette used saltier terms but i'll 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 uh, I'll call it down slightly. It's like, is it admirable at the very least that she's a bitch and she knows it and she admits it and she's up front with it rather than somebody who's just sort of oh, keeps yeah, it on the absolutely. down low? No. no, that's the whole thing. I when you, I saw you know I think you teach people how to you know uh, treat you. No, she knows she's a bitch. That's <laughs> that's a give. Me. That's a give me. You know, uh, you don't have to be a bitch to me, but I see it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, no, she she. Um, um, it's one of those things, you know, like I'm better than you, my shit don't stink. I don't, my bitch. Um, this is the way I am, but see, I'd rather someone be that way with me. I know where I stand with that person. Mm. So knowing that it's like, okay, I already know how she is. Um, but she's not going to treat me that way because mm. I'm not going to treat her a certain way and we're going to keep her professional. And that's just the way it, it was at that time, you know? Um, and, and I know she's had her problems over the years and things, and, and we all have our demons and, uh, battles and stuff that go on. But, um, man, uh, she had the fucking world out there, man. I mean, most downloaded and top the world and making all most downloaded on AL, OLL, whatever, mm. uh, and being on TV every week and, you know, had it all, but man, um, yeah, beautiful girl, um, ugly heart, yep. you know. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll uh, go to somebody who I know and know you are friends with, if, if nothing else, because you told me a little earlier, Bruiser Bedlam. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's never a story about Bruiser Bedlam that isn't just hilarious in one way or another. And since you were friends with him, you've got to give us a few funny ones. Uh, well, the first night, first of all, I'd been beating people on Smoky Mountain. I was a no-quit kid. And uh, a lot of times when, when Jimmy would bring some in, uh, like um, the Harris twins came in and uh, Brian Lee, Esther Cousins, he pulled them to the side and say, hey, this is Bobby Blaze, you take care of him, you know. Or Ricky and Robert would say something like, hey, Bobby's one of our regular two, take care of him, if I didn't know the person. But uh, Bruiser came in, so it's me and Ricky and Robert, and, and we're, we're talking to Bruiser, and yeah, he's he, legitimately just a big fucking brute cold as a whore's heart outside and he comes in wearing a fucking tank top and flip flops you know <laughs> like what, what the fuck you know he's got the hair thing and and i'm gonna be working him on tv and uh, this is actually one of the nights i stayed at the flop house actually and uh anyway um uh he's he's i said he said i would like to catch you and and do a power bomb uh, you think I can lift you up and see? So me and Ricky and Robert stand there. We're in the back uh, on a concrete floor. So Bruiser picks me up and gets me like almost to to his. My head is about where his waist is, and he starts to bend my body so my waist will go over his shoulder. Well, as he brings me down, because again we're on concrete, um, he's not going to slam me, or at least I hope he's not. But but right as I as he starts lowering me down. And I had done shit like this with Ricky and Robert before, so they kind of in on it. And um, I just reached down and, you know, I smacked the ground real quick. And and as soon as I did, he let go, and I just did a four roll. And I said, God damn it, man. I said, fuck. Well, he started me apologizing. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here's this big, but he didn't drop me on my head. I slapped the floor, and then rolled out of it. And so I knew what I was doing <laughs> to do it. And Ricky and Robert was like, oh, man, you hurt Bobby. And he goes, they started like, you know, you're – He's supposed to be making you look good on TV. And I'm selling it like, oh, man, what the fuck? You know, so I kind of ribbed him there at first day. And that popped up and we laughed about it. So we had a good little laugh about that. So that eased the tension right away. That eased the tension. And uh, then uh, say that, that night, um, whether he said duck or not, I don't know. But he fucking threw a haymaker. And he damn near broke my jaw. I mean, he just knocked me off my ass. And uh, I was just kind of out of my feet. And he may or may not have said this when I got to the corner. Didn't you hear I say duck? And I was, I was still out. I was like, I hear shit. And I go, go to the finish. Well, Cornette was managing. So I had to do something to get myself to the top rope to do the finish. So he, he missed something, but he made it very clear, like move, you know, and missed it. And then I went up top and he caught me. And, and we done the finish. It's very easy because I – we had already cleared the, the head space in the locker room, like I said. And so then we went to the flop house that night and he was like, man, I'm so sorry. I hit you. I'm so sorry. I hit you. And uh, he goes, I swear.
where I said, Duck, I said, it's, it's good. He didn't kill me, but I was, I was sore. And um, then um, uh, worked with him a couple more times, just little house shows, just real easy. Uh, he'd do the claw on me on my stomach to make me submit. And I'm like, I'm up here beating every motherfucker up here, uh, bruiser. And then you come in and make me quit my stomach, you know, claw or whatever. But then also um, he was working some up in Canada and up in Detroit. He actually got me uh, booked up there some with, um, it was a promoter, Gary. I can't, I can't say last name properly. One of Cornette's buddies, uh, Gary started with W. But anyway, he took me up there to uh, to some matches and the first night in uh, bruiser and i was in a locker room talking this and that and a promoter come by uh, a polish name i think gary windstorf or so. anyway he says uh i'm not paying you guys to be in here making love i'm paying you guys to get out there and wrestle and we're like oh no it's good we're, we'll tighten up out there because we was just sitting there bullshit and going through stuff but we gave him a good show you know and he really put that over he goes well, bruiser spoke a whole you know really good about you that's why i brought you in here but i'm you know we, we was just messing around the locker room you know and uh I guess he thought we wasn't going to go hard in the ring, but we did. Um, you know, I, I, in fact, Bruiser, um, I had I was had associations with the YMCA here in town, and th- I knew a lot of guys that lifted here. And uh, I said, Bruiser, would you come into town early that day? What would you charge me uh, for the first time he was going to wrestle Ashland? I said to come in and come in and do a bench press exhibition um, at the YMCA for me. And, um, and I had a guy already planned on, uh, being out there for all the people that showed up to sell tickets to him. They, you know, so, uh, had to work. And so I said, Bruce, what would it take? Well, at the time I was married and my wife was a pretty good cook and, uh, she cooked spaghetti really, really good. Um, and he said, I haven't had a good home cooked meal for a while. He said, do you think you can have your wife cook me a home cooked meal? I said, I sure can. I go, what, what do you want? He goes, what she do best. And I said, um, man, everyone that's ever read it, they love her spaghetti. He goes, make sure I get a home cooked spaghetti meal and I'll be in your town at this time. Hmm. He came in like at two o'clock, which is like four hours ahead of the show, you know, come to the YMCA and he pushed out like, the biggest lifter here was doing like, you know, a couple 405 guys, 450 guys, a couple 500 guys. Just it wasn't it wasn't a powerlifting gym for this area, but it was a pretty good gym. And uh, he come in and done 500 pounds for a couple reps and people just fucking freaked out, you know, because he, <laughs> he done his gimmick, you know, and um, we sold like 15 tickets. My buddy did and at, at $10 a pop or whatever. So there's another $150 going towards the house. And all I was out was a spaghetti dinner meal, you know. So uh, and I brought to him. uh he went from there down to the, to the building and uh, I brought his meal to him and she had garlic bread, uh, uh, salad, and also big, um, uh, Paul Newman cake she had made, uh, with caramel and chocolate and all that. And he was in heaven, man. He was in heaven. And, and Corny came to town and later on and managed them. Um, you know, so, um, yeah. Uh, I didn't, the thing is fucking guy's a killer. I didn't know. I, I mean, I, we talked to, we, he had the prison tat on the stomach and, um, and as, as you know, we read my book. I'd worked for a federal penitentiary for a couple of years there in between, you know, finishing up Malenko's and getting a contract. And in my second book, I wrote a story called Yard Time. So it's about, we brought a professional wrestling show into a federal prison. But anyway, so I had a little bit of experience that way, but uh, him and I always got along, man. And I'd, I'd rib him about his tattoo and, you know, stuff like that. And um, yeah, uh, I'm not saying we his best buddies or anything, but we certainly didn't have any issues. And I'm sure glad he didn't fucking try to fuck me up or blow my house up, you know. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> was he another part of like the biking thing around, uh, you know, the Smoky Mountain area? Was that just something in the past and future or he go in and out of, do you know? I think he must have went in and out of. And I, now, he may have had some people he hung out with in Knoxville or around there, but you know, when I went there, I would do three or four days at a time. Then I'd come back home and he was in his Jeep then. So, um, I don't know if he had a bike down there or not. I don't, I really don't know. I know he talked about it back home all the time, but, uh, and also I think more so in the pen when you have to, you know, they segregate themselves and he had his own gang in there really was, was the whole deal, you know, uh, protection in numbers, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, he was worth probably about five people on his own, I reckon. He was a scary looking <laughs> yeah. dude, if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a couple more smoky, then we're going to go to WCW, then the big finale, and then we'll wrap the podcast up. But um, okay. because you mentioned Bruce Bedlam, uh, he faced Randy Savage in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, the biggest match of his uh, life. He absolutely loved it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you faced Sean Waltman 
on a, mm-hmm. on a card, uh, probably uh, probably around ninety four as uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Who were the best, and who were the guys who treated it like a, a chore from the WWF who came to Smokey for a shot or two? Oh man, you know Undertaker came in um, and done a couple shots and did um, Pikeville, Kentucky, and Johnson City, Tennessee, and just come in and, and done his job. You know, uh, him and Percy Pringle come in and the houses went up. That was great. But, but uh, again, not a big talker. He just come in and done his job, whatever, you know, knew what his job was. Uh, then he came back, of course, for the Super Bowl um, of wrestling. He wrestled a uh, Unibomb down in, in Knoxville. Mm-hmm. Um, so he very professional, easy. and knows he's over. No, you know, um, the um, Sean was the show we done there is Marietta, Georgia. Owen Hart was on it. Lex Luger was on it. Um, Lex kind of done his thing. Owen done his thing. Um, I was with Sean. So that's the most person I had interaction with. I hadn't seen him for a while since we left Malenko's. We knew we had about 15 minute Broadway or 20, whatever it was. And uh, we're just going to work our ass off. He was easy. He was coming off a knee surgery and um, no ego whatsoever. Hey, Bobby, let's do our thing, you know. Uh, trying to think of who else come through there, you know. Uh, uh, I know there was Bossman. Oh, I know there was Shawn Michaels. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, also, um, Hawk came in. I don't think that was an issue. Bossman was, he come in, he knew the Armstrongs and knew a lot of the guys, and he was just a good guy to everyone. He, he remembered when I went to, to eventually WCW, he remembered me from being in Knox for those couple of days. Um, yeah, he was, he, he come in, done it, you know, he knew his business, and uh, he knew he was lucky to be on a, um, the circuit he was on, you know, away from doing a territory per se, he was, he was more than gracious and thankful for that. Uh, put that over. Um, trying to think. Sean Mike was come in, you know, work for Buddy, um, and and you know they had a hell of a match. Um, Sean, you know, he come in. I don't know that he. Um, I don't know how hard he was to work with behind the scenes or anything, but uh, you know he 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 just come in and done his gimmick. Um, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him. He was just, he's kind of done his own thing. Um, some people were asking for autographs and this and that, and I don't know if he didn't sit out. To this day, I really do not remember if he he went out and set up a table or not. Um, I, I really don't because um, I only saw him in a locker room real, real briefly, and that was that. You know, so limited interaction for him. Uh, who else? Uh, anyone? No, I didn't write down a comprehensive list. Yeah, but no, we, we've just, hit quite a few there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the guys were thankful to come in, and, and they do is coming in for corny, you know, and um, they had remembered, like Savage had remembered, you know, his family had come from a territory days. Um, I think he come in just being Randy Savage, just as intense as he always was, you know what I'm saying, and, and um, did the deal, that business only, you know, so. Hmm. And uh, Bruiser Bedlam pinned him as well. Yeah, uh, I, I love the screen on, but yeah, done, done the deal. You know, he done. Yeah, he took yeah. The, took the deal. Knew it, he knew it was going to enhance Bruiser and also put over Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And he knows who he knows who he is. He's Randy fucking Savage. You know what I'm saying? It, hmm. He he's still going to be over when he gets back on TV. You know exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now speaking of someone who's always over, uh, one of the greatest characters that all the fans loved, Prince Karis. Uh, you had the uh, you had the you had the stupid mummy thing. What was going on there? Was that a Rick Rubin suggestion? From my understanding, that's what it was. That's what I they wanted a mummy on the show. I, from my understanding, you know, he grew up on the uh, the California and lucha out there, and I guess I'm there was a Brazilian mummy at one time. I, you know, you hear the different stories, but from my understanding, yeah, it was a Rick Rubin's deal. Uh, Rob, the guy that did the deal, I knew him. Um, he was a really nice guy. I had done some independent wrestling with him uh, on Bobby Fulton shows. He was always doing some kind of gimmick. Bobby had these shows where everyone done a different gimmick, and uh, he was never the mummy there, but he was uh, different people, so he he could do it. And he was a big, strong guy, easy to get along with. Um and when he done the, the mummy thing, of course, who gets the rest one but Bobby Blaze? Because <laughs> uh, Corny will tell you, uh, Corny will tell you. And, and, and luckily, when I even got the WCW, Arn Anderson, one of the greatest compliments he ever gave was, Bobby, you can work with anyone, do anything we ask you to do, and it's no problems, you know. So, um, you know, uh, did I did I think it was a stupid idea to go out there and wrestle a mummy on TV? At the time, I'm thinking, yeah, this is probably stupid as fuck. But also – as a fan, 
the fans are going to see this and just go with the storyline and go out there and have a good match and, and make it the best you can, because there, there is something to it. You know, um, there's a reason where Corny wouldn't have asked me to work, you know, with the guy. Um, he knows I can do it. And that was my assignment that particular night and a couple of house shows or whatever. And, uh, easy to do. And I had fun with it. You know, I'd had fun, you know, knocking the powder off of them. And, and like I said, Rob, Rob was real easy to work with. Um, and then some people, uh, it was just a job for that, that those nights, you know, and it was fun. It was easy. First or second match. Um, the main thing I got out of it was hell, it was fun. And I thought if nothing else too, for the fans, some of them are going to see through it. But of course they had Daryl Van Horn doing all the, the mouthpiece and all that. Um, raunchy as can be, you know, crazy talking and all that. But, um, the gimmick itself was, um, yeah, it was probably pretty stupid, but also you're thinking back, we're doing a territory, we're doing a fan. The young kids would be like, I remember when I was fifth and sixth grade going to National Guard Armory and they had the mummy over here. And um, I don't know who that guy was at the time because uh, I, I got to know some of those guys as I got older. But but the mummy here, he would unwrap his hand and he had a nail that was exposed. And he'd just barely move around a ring really slow. And he'd try to hit these people with the, with the nail, but he was so slow he could never do it. And it was on our, on our cable access program here. And, you know, me and my, my brother and myself lived a couple blocks from the Armory, being in every show from a young kid. I just thought back to that, too. You know, it was a good time to – we knew the mummy wasn't going to hurt anyone. We knew it was <laughs> some guy dressed up in toilet paper, you know. So as a performer or a wrestler, I just knew go out there and try to do your best and have fun with it. Did, did the audience uh, – I'm glad to have a job. <laughs> yeah. did, did the audience – like, did any of them get on board with it, or did a certain amount get on board with it? The strange Kentucky people, as I think Chris Jericho has uh, termed them. Did uh, there was there a percentage that actually believed? Uh, probably, probably. <laughs> um, I, I, well, the, I heard. Sorry about that. Hit my knee. Um, I heard from some of the fans, and they was like, you know, that's bullshit, Bobby. That's crazy, you know, stuff like that. But I didn't. I just let it go in one ear at the other. I go, ah, he's tough, man. You know, I, I just kept going, you know, so, but I'm sure quite a few was like, Oh, you know, uh, just like they didn't like Jim Cornette hitting me up a tennis racket or something. They didn't like that. I had to wrestle a, uh, a mummy, you know, hmm. if they were my fans. So whatever. Uh, and you also mentioned Daryl Van Horn. Uh, I believe he got the word felch onto, uh, onto TV. Uh, <laughs> that was Jim Mitchell's like first sort of a uh, big deal, really. And then he went to WCW yep. and then ECW, but I- I'd love to interview Jim one day, but I mean, he just he strikes me as a cool dude. Yeah. Yeah. You should try to man. Um, very smart. Um, he, you, he, he, you get what you get with him, man. I always got along with him just fine, man. First, matter of fact, when I first went to WCW, he's one of the first people that I saw, and he was with uh, uh, Brian Clark, the um, who Raff. was doing rap at the time. Yeah, he was already been Adam Bomb, but he was doing rap, and uh, he was the Night Stalker in Smoky Mountain. Had just left when I was getting there, so I'd met him like the first couple of weeks, and then he was out. But uh, yeah, James was right there, and every time I saw him, I was like, hey, Bobby, glad you're, you know, from the first time I had my try, he wished me good luck that night when I had my tryout in Charlotte, he was like, Hey man, good luck to you. You know? So he, he understood coming what the situation was coming from a territory, especially when it shut down to now I've got a job or an offer to get a job, you know, with a major company and make some money. So, yeah. What killed Smoky Mountain off in the end? Um, well, I think it's no secret, you know, uh, Cornette had, uh, that's his baby and he was doing a lot in New York and, um, just really, really busy. I would like to think that uh, if Sandy Scott and and Mark Curtis had taken over it, you know, that Jimmy had given up a little bit of rain on that, uh, that may have lasted a little bit longer, but we were running into um, uh, building problems as far as, you know, uh, uh, money, uh, the TV tapings, I think were, you know, uh, eating up a lot of the money. Um, and I think it's just, uh, Jimmy was just exhausted. You know what I'm saying? He, he had, he had done what he said he was going to do. And um, I'm not sure if there was a time limit on the money that, you know, Ruben was uh, sponsoring. If they said, okay, we're going to do this for three years. And if it's not turn a profit or whatever, uh, I didn't get into that business of it. I just think, um, and, and I do think maybe Jimmy, you know, 
reason maybe he I know at the end some of the shows I was on like Sandy and 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 Mark or Brian Curtis with you know Mark Curtis or Brian Hill Brown would be there but Jimmy would be having to do driving from New York and doing this and doing that you know um I just think it was just um probably the right time for for him to end it um some of the guys had already moved on as well um uh, I loved it I just stayed there as long as they let me stay there um uh, and I think a few other people feel that way too. But um, yeah, I think it's just a combination of things. It's just the right time trying to compete with, uh, you know, um, WCW what they had going on and WWF what they had going on, ECW coming on. You know, it's just like it was just the right time, I guess. Really, um, it could have been several other little things. Like I said, maybe the the, the money might have been drying up or the agreement was coming to an end. Um, you know. Uh, like I said, it's a great time. Locker room morale was really good. Uh, Jimmy was good to everyone. Uh, you know, had we had good good office with, um, like I said, with uh, uh, Sandy Scott and Mark Curtis. Every, everyone worked hard and was working for a common goal. I just think it just, um, you know, sometimes things come to an end, and it was coming to an end. Yeah, it strikes me as a bit as of a shame, did. really, that because um, Jim Cornette himself said a couple of grand a week would be the difference between that surviving and not. Oh yeah, uh, if we could have got in, like, um, if we could have gotten a Chattanooga market on the far end of Tennessee, if we could have gotten a Cincinnati market uh, right above uh, Northern Kentucky here, or even Lexington, Kentucky, if we'd have got TV in one of those two. Also, we didn't even have a TV. Uh, in Huntington, West Virginia, or Charleston, if we'd have got that market. Sandy and I had actually uh, met with some people here in Ashland, as well as the people in Charleston that just didn't work. But hell, if we'd have had just uh, two of those I've mentioned, whether it be Chattanooga, um, uh, uh, I think Greenville, South Carolina, or Cincinnati, Ohio, or Huntington, West Virginia, we could have tied in two two more parts of the puzzle and we would have probably made it that way. And if we'd have gotten off four, it'd have been a hell of a bigger region uh, or territory. And I think we'd really have done, but you know, again, if wishes with horses, beggars would ride, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it just, we just didn't get to some of those markets, you know? Yeah. So. Uh, we, we've got a similar one. It's uh, if uh, you, your auntie had bollocks, you'd be your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a bit of a balls. I should have said, yeah. uh, but you, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. But uh, and also I was thinking, you know, if it just made it maybe into mid ninety six, then yeah. you know, was it a rising tide brings up all ships or whatever that saying is, and the wrestling business started exploding with the NWO and yeah. wrestling was getting yeah. more interest. In so if it just made it that much further, it could have been yeah. maybe that could have been and the feeder system to WWF instead of absolutely, OVW. Absolutely, absolutely, and and also uh, if we could have got like on a national. Uh, television channel. I, th I think the Nashville network that would have suited us fine, man. That was more of a smoky mountain than it was an ECW. If we could have got that kind of a deal, you know, on a national level, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, I was in England for about 30 days way back when. So the bollocks, you had a ball. So what, <laughs> what was your saying there? If you kicked yourself in your balls, what'd no, you say? It's, it's, if your auntie had bollocks, she'd be your uncle. Uh, Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I got gotcha. <laughs> you. If if if, 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 if if some butts were candy and nuts, we'd all be eating fruit. I think it's around the similar of that. Okay. One. So uh, I know your back's hurting in that chair and everything. Yeah. So we'll get to WCW. We'll get to the main event. Um. So WCW, uh, your run, you were there for about three years, guaranteed money. Yep. It was the right thing for you to do. The great thing about WCW, as far as I'm concerned, is up to about 1999, you would just get two names who had absolutely no history together and just or even style clash I just put them together and yeah. the first match that comes up with you is is you versus Juventud Guerrera and it's just the okay. most random matches <laughs> and that was one of the reasons why WCW was so great for me do you remember any like just completely odd matches that you were involved in oh yeah well that one I had actually uh finished up uh what I was supposed to do contractually for that week and I had actually went to Columbus Ohio to pick up some different wrestling gear came home, had a mess with my machine to be in San Bernardino the next day. And I scheduled a wrestle with two girl. And I was like, where the fuck did that come from? You know, it's just one of those weird things, man. Uh, you could go in and I know for a while there, uh, they were trying to put me with people that I could, you know, work with. And like Terry Taylor would like sometimes say, okay, uh, you're, you're off today, Bobby, for this reason, they want to put me with someone else, you know, but, um, that was just, that was just, uh, your road agents are trying to keep as Dean Malenko told me one time, uh, prior to him leaving was, uh, uh, 
um, you know, Bobby got a lot of guys here just trying to hang on to their last check, you know, so you'd go in and Terry Wack tell me this, uh, Arn would tell me this, and then Paul would tell me something different, you know, and all three of them had the best interest of me in mind, but they also knew, excuse me, their job was online too. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So yeah, matches like that would come up all the time. I was originally going to do, um, come in and work with the guys from the power plant and I was going to get some wins and then also help them guys out. The ones that were like, like, like your, um, Ernest Miller and, and, and Glacier and those guys, um, that needed more, you know, veteran to lead them through matches and get them over on TV. And then at the younger one that coming through, just beat them up so you could, or to get a win, you know, so I would still be strong enough that, you know, equal opponent kind of thing. And of course, you know, at one point, um, Terry had told me, oh, we got that idea. It was um, uh, Ron Bam Dan was doing uh, Mr. Saturday Night up or Mr. Mr. Monday Night in, on Raw. And Terry said, hey, we're going to try to do this thing. Maybe Mr. Mr. Saturday Night, we're going to start giving you some wins. And then Terry left. And so I got to the, the next show uh, for TV. And Arn said, hey, Bobby, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, Arn, I said, can I just ask something? He, his thing was, you know, like we're just two gentlemen discussing business. Sure. I said, I said, I, I thought we was, I was going to get some wins. I said, I know it's a work, whatever. I said, well, I thought we were going to start doing this thing, maybe Mr. Monday night or Mr. Saturday night. And he goes, well, that was Terry and Terry's not here. And I was like, okay, I get it. He goes, who you working on? I said, uh, Alex Wright. He goes, you can have a good match with Alex. Just go out there and have a good match, you know? So I was like, and then Terry come back and that was Ick Nade, you know? So I was like, um, I just glad and like Arn said, don't give them a reason. Don't give them a reason. You know, they were letting people go left and right. And I was one of the last ones to go that wasn't on one of the big, big contracts, you know. So I stayed as long as I could. That was because I did my job. I did what Arn asked me. Jimmy Hart was helping there at the end, trying to get show, you know, make sure it was making the TVs and stuff. Um, yeah, it's just uh, but the matches themselves, fuck, they sometimes they didn't make any sense at all, man. Honestly. Uh too many too many Indians, not enough chiefs. You know, this person telling you this, this person telling you that, this person's refusing to work with that person. You know, crazy. Mm. Uh, when you were brought into WCW, um, you've been in WWF locker rooms, Grand Prix, Smoky Mountain, various other locker rooms. Was the WCW one, could you just tell there was a bit of tension in the air when you walked in, or is that a bit overblown? Um, it was, there was some tension for sure. Um, Everyone just kind of broke off into their own little groups, really. Uh, Hogan had his locker room. You know, Sting was there for a while, then he was gone. I and mean, he came back, he had his own deal because um, he was doing the uh, Crow gimmick, I guess, at that point and taking some time off. Um, uh, the, the, the main locker room itself, you know, you'd go into catering. And again, people were eating with the same people that you, you kind of, migrated to your little group you know what i'm saying uh clicks if you will uh yeah there was there was definitely and there was you know hey guys saying you know um they're bigger stars than this guy uh some guys weren't even eating catering they were going the bigger guys were like going out and eating somewhere and then getting you know if we had to be there at one they're coming in at four if we had to be there at four some of those guys were coming in at six you know i'm talking about some of the bigger stars but uh yeah there was underlying tension there at all times you know at all times it was uh there was some joking around and stuff like that but for the most part it was just like yeah you know like um you'd have uh like Malenko or Eddie and Chris and Jericho, their little group. Uh, I might be at the Armstrongs over here. And then some of the Minnesota guys like Kurt and that group would be over here. You know, it was just everyone, like I said, kind of self uh, segregated. So like the, the, a lot of Hispanic, the Mexican guys, uh, they, you know, pretty much stuck together as did the Japanese guys. Um, I think everyone worked together really well considering all the stuff that could have happened. Um, but uh, yeah, there was just, uh, I think a lot of people there too were, like thankful to be having a check and so i'm going this could be my last fucking check you know so yeah uh, they never knew what the hell they was going to do with you anyway <laughs> they tell you one thing and something else would happen you how, know. how many bosses did you have at one point who were giving you instructions from the top oh uh, well like for me uh mostly when, when i went to the war room uh you know mostly like arn or terry taylor or Kevin Sullivan, those three were the main I listened to. But also, you know, I reported to Orndorff a couple of times, you know, uh, 
he stayed, depending on where we was at, if we was in Florida, Orndorf would be one of the agents there as well, or I went to the actual office in Atlanta. Um, you know, but mostly I, mostly I stuck with and talked to, uh, and Jimmy Hart too, um, uh, towards the end, especially Jimmy Hart, but mostly I spoke with Terry, um, Arn, and uh, Kevin Sullivan. I spoke to one of them. I mean, one time Kevin was in the back, Terry opened the door when I was asking how a match was. And um, I said something to, let's see, Kevin was back. I, was, I said, thanks, boss, like that. And he goes, Terry goes, which one of you call him boss? We're not fucking bosses or something like that. They both just started laughing. I go, hey, man, I'm just glad I have a job. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and that's someone they put me over on and I asked how the match was, you know, but I just I just made a reference like, you know, boss. And the, they both just kind of laughed, you know, like, um they knew they was just one step ahead of me really uh, been there a little bit longer and had more experience and was just like hanging on that last check too, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Uh, but those three, mostly that's Kevin, um, nothing but respect for him. I think he has one of the greatest minds, professional wrestling. And then Arn, Arn and I spoke so many times, man, he gave me so many insightful things, uh, ways to go, ways to go about things, uh, respectful, professional comments. I, I can't speak well enough about, uh, my thoughts and respect for Arn Anderson, then uh, Kevin, or excuse me, Terry, like I said, Terry brought me, you know, helped me get in. He gave me the call. Uh, he said, impress him during the tryout match. And um, Terry was always good to me for whatever reason. Mm. So maybe cause I could work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, just saying. Hey, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt in the wrestling business. If you know how to do what right. you've got to do. Right. Um, I'll ask one more just about the um, inner working. So uh, as more of a WWF fan myself, I've got a, a very fairly good idea of how you get to a TV taping uh, at a certain time, hang around mm-hmm. for pre-tapes, whatever you find out who your opponent is. You've got agents, you've got the gorilla position. Right. Uh, Vince McMahon's always there. If you need to talk to him for, or Jim Ross, let's say if, this was around this time frame, uh, you know, for talent relations. Uh, what was WCW's structure as far as uh, who do you get your matches off? Who uh, were there even any agents? I don't think there was any guerrilla yeah. position. Was there? Yeah. Well, like I said, we had what's called a war room, and in there would be either Arn, you know, a couple of usually Arn and and uh, like Terry or what someone being there giving you a finish, you know. Um, so you had the war room and that's where you, you go in. Um, now, if we weren't in Orlando, they had, a, they, they had the board up and it'd say, you know, um, uh, James versus Bobby, you know, segment segment one, match one, whatever. Well, we'd go to the war room and, it, you know, we'd pretty much know, okay, you're going over tonight and we need you to get like seven or eight minutes or what have you. Uh, once that was said, you know, pretty much you just go to um, – our gorilla spot, it could be any number of people, but the Orndorf was there a few times, you know, Jody Hamilton would be there. Um, uh, Jody was there most, almost every time, but Paul would be there. Uh, just, uh, it could be any of those guys at any given time. And then when you come back through the match, um, again, they may be waiting for the next match. So, uh, it was, it was, it wasn't as organized as what you're saying with WWF or WWE, but there was a little bit of a system that you went to the war, you got who you was working, working with, you went to the war room, um, you went over your match for briefly, and you had an idea of what time you were going to go on, and you got to the curtain, and they'd say, hey, you got, we know we told you had five minutes, you got three minutes or whatever it is, and then you just, you know, come back through, and you report back to whoever sent you out. A lot of times I'd come back to Arn and say, you know, how was it? you know, and, or they would send someone for you because maybe like when I worked with uh, Scott Norton, um, we had a really good match, big, you know, he's a big, strong guy. And, um, he took care of me and, uh, Arn called me in and said, Hey, how was he? Was he stiff? This and that. Cause he was getting ready to do another program. I was like, no, it's fine. You know, every, he actually was happy that I had a good match with him. He said, it's the best match he's had since he's been back here. Mm-hmm. And he said, he did. And I go, yes, sir. And so here comes Norton brought on my ass. I didn't even know he was there. And he comes in, he goes, Arn, put me up anytime you want, man. He goes, that's the best match I've had since I've been here. And I was like, you know, maybe feel good, but yeah, sometimes Bobby Eaton sometimes be waiting also, um, because he cared for the boys. He'd be able to go, you know, next time, put your chin down on that belly to belly or, you know, that's a good match or uh, Orlando at the worldwide Terry was taking care of me there. So that's why I reported for 10 days, you know, and he'd always ask me, you know, does so-and-so take care of you? like especially at Goldberg, uh, uh, Brian uh, Clark, those big guys like that, they say, Bobby, they take care of you. And I said, yeah, 
it took care of me. It's easy. And they, okay. You know, but yeah, there was a little bit of structure. It wasn't just, you know, wasn't wild crazy, but it was, there was some structure. Uh, I will ask you about Bob, uh, Bobby, uh, Bill Go, uh, Goldberg in a second, but I've got to ask, uh, when you were looking at the blackboard, uh, did you ever mistake Bobby B for Bobby E and turn up at the wrong time? No, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <fair> no. <laughs> I had to ask. I had to ask. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I wear glasses all the time. Normally I wear glasses. I, I, I see any, like if my name was Scott, and I was in WCW, I'd be turning on to every other, like, I'd be coming to every other match, Scott Levy, Scott Hall, <laughs> Scott Norton, Scott, just everyone's yeah. Scott. No, I didn't wear glasses then, but no, I never <laughs> had that problem. I knew, <laughs> you know, I knew who I, I, knew who I was. <laughs> I knew who I was where I was supposed to be. <laughs> so. Good man, good man. Oh, I'd turn up to the wrong time. I'll go Well, you brought up Goldberg before. You were number 70 in the streak. Oh, I ha- thought I was 67. Okay. Uh, uh, well, this is according to Wikipedia. So, you know, Wikipedia. Oh, I, I believe Wikipedia now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. who are you to doubt Wikipedia and the That's oddballs right, who, who update That's right, man. That's right. see, it's still close enough, though. 67 or 70. That's not too far off. Yeah. It was uh, worldwide in April 1998. Um, yeah. Uh, were the worldwide, they weren't still at Disney at this point, were they? Yeah, universal. Tapings? Yeah. Universal. Uh, uh, were they still farming in the families and stuff as part of the... Um, yes. Yeah. They, I think they held about... Uh, I think that building held about 300 people. And they would, you know, go out through the tram and drive around on, on, on the property and, you know, bring them into the air-conditioned one-hour show. Uh, if we started, like, at 10 o'clock in the morning, that show would go to 11. A half an hour break. Uh, the next show at noon till 1. Half an hour break. 1.30 to 2.30. Just like that format throughout the day. Uh, the thing about the Goldberg match was, uh, was great. Um, Bill was, Bill was super nice. No ego when he was there. He was like, I heard him say it more than once in the locker. He was talking about, uh, we was on a pay-per-view and he was talking about how he fell down on the 40 in his tryout for like San Diego or somewhere, you know, before he went to Atlanta and just telling funny stuff, talking about his Thanksgiving, how good a Thanksgiving he had and how blessed he was. No ego whatsoever. Just, you know, and he'd, he'd say stuff like, you know, Hey guys, I'm getting a push because the boss would give me a push. He knew. But uh, anyway, when we was in Orlando, um, he asked me if I'd like to go to the ring and just go over a few things with him. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And um, so we had that half an hour break. And um, so and I'd seen him work enough and I pretty much know the deal. Well, you know, not going to give me a lot, but then um, he's going to, you know, um, spear me and jackhammer me. So um, we're in there and, he said, well, let's just work around a little bit and just feel each other out. What do you think? And I said, that's fine. I see, you know, whatever. So um, I took him off his feet and I got him down on the mat. Well, about that time, and we was trying to work. We were just trying to work, okay? What try to shoot on each other or anything. I was just trying to show him that, you know, here's some ideas. Because he was still open to his ideas. Because I said, have you ever thought about tightening this up? And I had him on a mat. And I showed him how to put a headlock. And then really, you could put your knee against the guy and crank him in here without hurting him. And that was, so anyway, no sooner had I taken him down and had him down, Arn Anderson comes through <laughs> the curtain. And um, I'm letting him up. And. Arn goes, Bobby, come here. And he goes, don't take him off his feet. <laughs> I go, well, we we're, we're just working. He goes, don't take him off his feet. And I, I like that a lot because, but Bill took it the right way. I was just showing him something, you know, it wasn't like I was in there just beating on him, nothing like that. And I said, okay, let's, let's not do this, Bill. Let's not just don't sell this. I'm going to go for this. Don't sell it. He was like, okay, okay. But he was going to give me something where I took him down. That would have been great. So I said, how about this? And um, I said, when they, when, when they introduced me, I'll come over the top rope and I'll give you a flying form and you don't sell it. So then I'll give you the second form and then you take over that way I'm getting something in. So that's what we agreed upon was that because I was going to do something else and I took him right down and he was rather surprised. I will say that, but in a, again, respect, way um but it's just funny that Arn happened to come through during that time so uh but then the match when a match took place half an hour 45 minutes later whatever i, I jump over the top row stiff form he stands there no cells bash him again no cells then he just picks me up and gorilla slams me i go to a corner i'm coming out here he comes with that the spear and then uh jackknife 
Jack, you know, suplex. Jack, Terry right. Taylor's waiting on me. Terry Taylor said, Bobby, how close were you? Because he snapped me at the last second, real close to the, thank goodness for the mullet, because the mullet hit the, the ring. My hair hit the <laughs> mat, you know, not my, luckily not my head or my neck. And Terry asked me, how, how was it? And I told him, he said, he gets you over in that rotation good. I said, yes, sir, he did, no worries. As soon as I got behind a curtain, Goldberg's waiting right there. He's, hey, Bobby, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the match. Um, maybe we do it again sometime. Nothing but complimentary. And then I go back to where I normally dressed at, and Nick Patrick was back there, usually where the Armstrong were at. He's from Atlanta, you know, lived in that. So we all hung out in little the, the southern white trash area, if you will. <laughs> that was our deal. But uh, Nick Patrick said, Bobby, I was untying my boots. And he goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm untying my boots. He goes, I don't see how he said the last time I saw your boots, they were stuck out in the middle of the ring. He's, <laughs> he, he speared you out of your boots. I think they're still in a ring. And we had a big laugh about that, you know, but it was easy and fun and experienced that we could joke that, Oh, I'm victim number 67 or 70 or whatever, you know? And I know people has met Bill outside of wrestling at an airport here or there that know me personally. And they've went up and they dropped my name and Bill has always been very complimentary. Oh, okay. We tell Bobby Howard or something. You know, I'm like, this guy don't need me. I'd tell one of my friends, a bartender, and he traveled between here and Lexington or Lexington in Florida. Uh, and, and he ran to him at 6 a.m. And I'm like, man, don't be fucking bothering these guys at six o'clock in the morning at the airport. And he goes, well, I just want to tell you, you know, I saw Goldberg and he had nothing but nice stuff to say about you. And I'm like, well, we're for fucking professionals. Of course we are. I said, but he's just trying to get back to home, you know, <laughs> leave these fucking guy. You know, I was joking the guy, of course. And he goes, well, I just dropped your name. And I was like, well, I get that, but I'd rather you didn't, <laughs> uh, but no, Bill's always been complimentary at a way, uh, as a fan, he, he understands, you know, he's gotten bugged a lot more other people than my friends, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So, and, um, he didn't hurt you. No, hell no. He took care of me, man. I was appreciative of that too. Mm. Um, like I said, we was, and for me to say, I don't want to interrupt to say, oh, Bobby's out there bragging. He took Goldberg off his feet. Well, yes and no. We were working together to work a little spot. It just so happened. I like telling that part because Aaron came through during that time, like I had actually taken him off his feet, you know, like, oh, okay, you know. So well, it's funny, we just changed it up. It's funny you mention that, actually, because around this time period, William Regal did take him off his feet. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't yeah. know if you remember the reaction to that. I don't know if you were in the back, but I mean that was very around yeah. April time. Yeah, well, that's probably why it was said. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> because uh, yeah, because um, yeah, I guess Bischoff comes through or Regal comes through the curtain, and Bischoff's going, "What are you doing? You're destroying my monster. You're destroying my baby." You know. Uh, well, if he can't take care of himself, maybe he should be champion. <laughs> and, and William Regal's one of my favorites, man. I mean, I love that guy's style. I love the way he can work. I love the psychology. There's not one thing I don't like about uh, Lord Stephen or William Regal. Um, and I. Uh, I was on his side on that the whole way. I was like, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, I saw him get eat up and he got ate up. You know, yeah. uh, you got to fight back. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you're not uh, going to take anything, you know. Yeah. But that's, yeah. but that's just an experience. And uh, I'll ask you one yeah, more thing, yeah. then we'll get on to the main event because I know we're, I know you're suffering a little bit in the chair. Um, Eric Bischoff, uh, thoughts, how many meetings did you have with him? And was he, uh, was he only hands on with the very top? talent in yeah, the million I think, plus uh, the first night for the first night i met him um you know shook his hand uh welcome board well then i had my match and i was coming in the back and um he says um uh, I'm, I'm walking it's just us he's walking one direction I'm, I'm walking another but we're looking at each other make you know stopped enough to make eye contact but he's obviously getting ready to go on live tv because i had done a dark match and he goes yeah that, uh, that's a good match louie and i went oh I said, I'm Bobby. Louie was the opponent. He goes, yeah, my bad, Bobby. Yeah, good match. And I was like, I wasn't getting snipey with them or smart ass, but I was letting him know, like, I'm, I'm not Louie. I'm Bobby, you know, just to let you know. And he was cool with it. He didn't be an asshole or whatever. I got the contract. So that says something, you know, Louie, Louie did as well. Um, and a couple other times, you know, we spoke, you know, how are you? Nice, you know, whatever. But he mostly was hands on with guys that made like 500,000 plus, you know, the top guys up there making the money um talk to him one other time just a handshake uh after a pay-per-view and i said hey man i appreciate getting booked on this uh you know thank you very much you go hey thank you We're, it was good um other than that the only other time i had anything um 
something was said, I was supposed to go to Knoxville to wrestle Booker T. And um, I guess um, Bischoff said uh, he doesn't have enough TV experience to be on Earth Booker T. And they, they put someone with even less experience. They put Lash LaRue in there. But anyway, they took me from Terry Taylor. He's got Taylor no experience, that guy. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, but Booker T come up and apologized. I said, man, Bobby, I know we could have really done some stuff in there. And then then Terry Taylor come up to me and he apologized. He was like, Bobby, I, this is one of one of the best compliments. But um, he goes, um, uh, you're going to probably be working with uh, – uh, Raf and he done the job yesterday for like Nash. He goes, he done a job for the boss. He said, you probably don't get a lot. He goes, uh, just, uh, just no, uh, apologize. And, uh, cause I'm thinking I'm going to work Booker T in Knoxville where I'd worked out for three years and be able to get some shit in with Booker T. But, uh, then Terry Taylor turned around and goes, Bobby. And there are several guys sitting around me. He goes, you're the most unused piece of talent we have in WCW. And he shook his head and turned and walked away. And I just like, and they all just started popping for me. And I was like, well, in just a second, I'm going to go here and do a three-second squash match with Rap. You'll see how over I am, you know. <laughs> but that's the only time word came from Bischoff that I didn't have enough TV time uh, to wrestle Booker T, which was bullshit. Um, anyway, no, 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 no heat, no big deal. Um, you know, controversial, you know, creates cash or whatever his little deal was. Um, you know, he – I didn't work directly for him, but indirectly, you know, uh, I had no heat. I, I I didn't think he had much of a personality, you know, and I kind of put that in my book. But again, I didn't go in there to bury anyone either, you mm-hmm. know. But that's his personality dealing with uh, a group of people in a whole, uh, you know, a whole group of people because he'd have these little meetings sometimes and things would be said and like he's pissing a lot of people off, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't have any my interaction with a couple of handshakes and, and, um, you know, thank yous. And that was it. Hmm. Uh, and you never met Vince Russo, did you? No, no. Look at you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. I, I'm yeah, not a fan. So, but I'm sure he might not be my fan either. That's fine. But I'm a cornet. <laughs> I'm a cornet guy, as you know. So. Mm-hmm. And, so. uh, in, in my opinion, rightly so in my opinion, rightly so. Right. Okay. Uh, so I will give you the main event, uh, and we're going to do firing line, as I always call it. Uh, I'm going to fire some names at you, and uh, we're going to go back to Smoky Mountain. So this is a Smoky Mountain edition. Uh, if a uh, amusing story tumbles from your le- lips uh, when the uh, name is mentioned, then uh, please let it flow freely. And the first name is Brian Hildebrand. Ah, uh, I love Brian, man. Great guy. Love the business. He loved the business, and. Um, uh, tremendous uh, referee, and um, he could actually work. He just wasn't very big, but I've worked out with him in the rings before. We used to always do 50 to 100 Hindu squats before the matches at most shows. Just, just We just did it. He was old school like that, and I was really keeping up my conditioning then. Um, rest in peace, man. I love that guy. He's a great guy. Mm. Uh, were you a fan of the turtle uh, gimmick? You know what? What's funny was I was talking about them Bobby Fortin shows. Um, I the first show I did, Brian actually had a show in Knoxville, but he was supposed to be the turtle on the show I was on, and Bobby Fortin ended up doing it. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? It was for that time, um, the Ninja Turtles were popular and this and that. But uh, sometimes you got to just mix your show up a little bit, man. Um, and and he could do it. So uh, why not, you know? Um, I didn't dislike it. I just know for, for some of the shows he'd done it on, like especially, and I know that they had the match with Cornette and stuff, but some of the shows like independently, with one, like I said, referring back to the Bobby Fulton shows or big time wrestling or whatever, the kids loved it. So, it, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, so it's purpose, definitely. Um, yeah. Do you remember sure. who played the Dark Secrets? Yes. I had to work with him. That was uh, Brian. He was. Brian Armstrong. And I worked with him like one of his first two or three matches, actually. Um, easy, easy, easy. Worked for, actually worked a whole weekend, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon gig uh, together. So, yeah. Uh, good guy. Uh, good uh, guy. We, we, different time frame for both our lives. And, um, you know, things were different. So uh, we had some fun. Good matches, had some fun, and that's that. <laughs> um, I was good friend with all the Armstrongs, though. So uh, another Armstrong may be coming up in this as well. But that's I'm, fine. Uh, sure. you've already mentioned Robbie Eagle, so I'll skip through yeah. Robbie Eagle, and I'm going to go. Uh, do you know you mentioned him as well? But uh, no one ever seems to know much about Brian Lee. So anything about Brian Lee, you can tell us. Man, um, had that tryout match against him, and uh, he put me over big time. Uh, done a couple of TVs where he was going to, where he was managed by Tammy 
and uh, instead of doing his big finish or something, he just give me something easy. He always took care of me. Um, never had any heat with Brian whatsoever. Uh, partied a couple times, whatever. Um, was in the Johnson City, was in the mall uh, with my wife at the time, walking through and out of nowhere, Brian comes out from behind of like some clothes or something in a store and globs me in the side of the jaw with a working punch. <laughs> and this is when he's getting ready to go up there and be the underfaker, right? right. And he and he's go, I got you, Bobby Blaze, like that. And I popped, scared to shit out of my wife. And I popped because of the working punch. If it had been a shoot, he'd kill me. And uh, uh, he just started laughing, man. And we just started talking about how good his success is. And I wished him, he's on pizza boxes. And I, that was the last time I ever saw the guy. He just, we was in the mall at the same time. He come out and like I said, he did me a working punch in public. <laughs> and, and we started talking about his career and he was getting ready to do a big deal. And that was that. So I guess he ended up going to ECW and doing a bunch of other stuff. And I have no idea where the guy's at or how he's doing or anything. Um, but he was always good to me. Mm. Uh, he, um, I, I'll bring this up just because I've just reminded myself of it. Uh, Jim Mitchell in an interview years ago credits Brian Lee with um, teaching him how to treat the ladies uh, that they uh, may have around. And the uh, lesson was uh, never, ever pay for anything. Let them pay for you. Um, was that <laughs> <laughs> was who, who smartened you up to uh, that particular rule? Um, probably, probably Eddie Watson, Goldie Rogers up in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good man. Couple Smart man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, excuse the impression, but, uh, the next name is Jamie by God down D. <laughs> That's funny. I was just telling my brother, he asked me about Jamie the other day. Um, he was watching a shoot video or something. I, I've only been around Jamie a few times. And um, it was when Ricky wasn't in Smoky Mountain at the time. So Robert and I was teaming together and we had to wrestle PG-13. Well, I only seen him on TV and I hadn't met him in the back yet or talked to him. And um, I told Brian Hildebrand or Mark Curtis, I said, Mark, I said, you tell these little fuckers I'm here to work. If they don't want to work. It's going to be a long night. And I said, and when I get that hubcap in a finish, I better not feel a fucking thing because the shit will go on. Because I'd heard their reputation a little bit, being smart asses and stuff. And uh, Robert Gibson was looking at me. He goes, Bobby, you ain't got anything to worry about. I said, yeah, you don't because you're Robert Gibson. I said, I ain't been in a ring with them. I'm not letting them take advantage of me. So fuck that. I just sent them the word. So Mark's all serious. He goes over. Do we get in a ring? As soon as we lock up, like, hey, brother, you ain't got nothing to worry about for us. And they worked. That's the, the, the hubcap got boom, bang. I didn't feel shit. Take the pin one, two, three. Bill after was there the whole weekend and, um, uh, kept putting the match over. And every time they was like, don't, you ain't got, I don't know why I just felt like they may, you know, take advantage of me, but they didn't. They were very professional. I got to know Wolfie D a little better than I did Jamie, but um, due to some other times. But yeah, both those guys, they worked light as can be with me. I appreciated it. There was nothing but professional with me. And I appreciated that. And um, I don't have anything bad to say about either one of them because it was all business only, man. Mm. And um, when I saw him out in um, the Super Bowl of Wrestling, uh, where I was involved in another match, um, you know, went right up to him, shook their hand, thanked them again, you know, for easy work. Uh, good luck on the show tonight. Just very professional, no worries whatsoever. So, and I have, and I see these shoot videos and how crazy he is. I, I don't have that kind of interaction with him and that that's his deal. I just, man, I hope he's in a good place. You know, he's mm. crazy. Seems yeah. to be, but for me, no worries. No worries. Yeah. But you know what? The wrestling business sorely is missing is some actual crazy people. Oh yeah, no, we need people like that. That's for damn sure. I think I think Tom Pritchard said that he he yep. knew him a lot better than I did. That's the whole thing. Dirt, di all walks of life of people are involved in professional wrestling, and you need very real people like that. You know, Jamie's just one of them real people, man. He lives the gimmick. He's the, the hillbilly, the you know redneck, the you know racist, whatever. It, you know, whatever he does his whole thing. You know, that's that's him, man. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think wrestling does need that because they're the real person. But I was just talking about my interaction with them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the dirty, uh, the, uh, easy for me to say, the dirty Dutchman. Dutch Mantel, mm -hmm. great guy, man. Um, man, full of wisdom, um, easy to work with. I had to work with him a couple of times. Uh, 
that he would, um, let's see, always have something witty to say about me or to me. I saw Dutch a couple years ago at a WrestleCade down in North Carolina, and Dutch is just Dutch. We done a, uh, we had a panel, and um, uh, uh, Cornette and Dutch, myself, Tracy, a bunch of other guys, Bobby Fulton, some others. But, but um, yeah, Dutch is just, uh, uh, if you listen to Dutch, you can learn a lot, man. Uh, that's for sure. I listen to him and um, always gain knowledge from him. And I'll say this, I used to shoot basketball. Uh, some of the guys in Smoky Mountain did. And, and Dutch, Dutch, believe it or not, could actually shoot a basketball pretty damn good. <laughs> there were several of us there that could play ball um, or at least shoot at that time. And, and Dutch actually had a nice shot. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, could, could, could anyone dunk? Old. Could anyone dunk? Yeah, fuck. Uh, the Harris twins could dunk. I could dunk at one time, but by the time I got there, I couldn't. I, I was, uh, yeah, I could dunk up to I was about 25, 26, but by the time I was 30, my knees, I couldn't. There was, I'd lucky get the rim then. But no, the <laughs> Harris twins, uh, both of them were like 6'10. They rattled a, they, they actually rattled a rim, surprised the fuck out of me a couple of times. We'd be out there playing, and whoever got there first got the ball. I think Robert Gibson and I would usually play. Um, and then Dutch would come out and shoot. And then, uh, but the Harris boys, they could dunk the fuck out of it, man. <laughs> now, in WCW, I'll say this me and Barbarian, Robbie Eagle, and a couple other guys would play out back of our hotel. Bobby Eaton never played. He'd sit there and watch. But uh, Booker T. Uh, but Barbarian actually has a good shot, too, believe it or not. He, he played in the church <laughs> league, he said. He, he Don't come down the middle, though, because you're getting a clothesline. He don't know, understand the word foul, you know. But, uh, yeah, anyway, back to Dutch. Good dude. Um, very smart. Um, I really respect Dutch. And, um, yeah. I was going to say, forget Dutch. I mean, I'm more interested in this WCW Basketball League. You get to, oh, so the Maestro and so, the Barbarian and you. Yeah. Oh, so we had uh, we'd invite people. We had a hotel room that had a basketball court out back, and uh, we'd play after after Disney. We'd play or Universal rather. We'd go back there and play basketball before we went out to eat, or, or if it wasn't a gym night, because I'm with the lift. Because you have to be there. You have to be there early in the morning and before the traffic and stuff. You don't have time to work out in the morning, but usually in the evening you do. But yeah, me and Maestro, uh, Barbarian, we was the main three to get them together. We had Booker T come by. We had uh, shit. Who else came by? I can't remember. But Bobby Eaton was always with us because him and Barb were together, and me and Stro were together, uh, or Maestro. Yeah. So, but Bobby would sit there and you know have beers and watch us play. But um, I can't remember who else would come down there. But that was pretty much a nightly game every time we were there. <laughs> Yeah, well, that you know, of of the information that I love to just the most random stuff that might be one <laughs> of the best ever. Uh, I've got a few more for you, uh, Casey O'Connor. Uh, limited interaction when I first got there because he was. I wasn't sure if he was a fan. I wasn't sure if he was on board with the office. Uh, he was always good to me and cool to me, but um, I could, he kind of had a smart ass little personality, but nothing bad to me. It just like uh, that's why I didn't know if he's like a fan, if he was a. Uh, well, I knew he wasn't one of the boys at that point. He was just a fan, and also he was doing something in the office, but I think he was also trying to come across to me that he had more power in the office than what he did. So I was always like a little bit standish of him. Um, I didn't get a good or bad vibe. I just got this vibe of like, hey, I'm just doing my own thing here, pal, you know, because I don't know what your fucking deal is. And I really didn't. To this day, I don't know. I guess he was a fan, and I guess he uh, was helping Cornette some to an extent, and then – Things blew up, but I I just stayed out away from all that. Yeah, then so, his car got nothing bad to say about him. <laughs> I was going to say yeah. then his car got smashed up with a baseball bat. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't know about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, the <laughs> the stormtrooper. Uh, don't know anything about him. I think the TV tapings that he was on, I was not on. I think that was early on. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I don't recall being on a taping with him. And I, I honestly, I don't even know who it is. I don't know who done the deal. Nope. Um, nope. Uh, that's uh, an air ball then in basket. I know. Yeah, I know a couple. Ball. I know basketball yeah. terminology like a tiny air, bit. Air ball. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> uh, the Punisher. If, do you remember who the Punisher was? Uh, Bull Buchanan. It was Bull Buchanan. Yeah. yeah. Um, very limited. Uh, he was working uh, with um, who? Uh, Tracy, maybe Brad Armstrong, something like that. But no, I didn't. Uh, shook his hand a couple of times. That's it. Didn't ever work with him. Didn't have any, no outside of ring interaction whatsoever. Um, just see him in a locker room here, or there. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not, not enough to even tell you, you know, had a cup of coffee together, nothing like that, you know? Yeah. 
So. Uh, I brought up Taz earlier, which you mentioned, um, or in fact you did. Uh, so I've got two more for you, Tommy Rich. Someone say something about some fried chicken, cold beer, you know, Tommy, <laughs> Tommy, this Tommy, man. Um, I knew Tommy a little bit, um, just from seeing him on a couple independent shows. Then he came back into Smoky Mountain while I was there and he just, uh, just Tommy Rich, just so he trying to steal my gimmick, Bobby Blaze, you know, cause he's the wildfire. That's where I got when we first opened up. Uh, you said a, a great Commodore song too, easy, like a Sunday morning. First time we got in a ring together, all we had was a finish uh, for a TV taping. And, uh, you know, I took him to a corner. He said, easy like a Sunday morning, baby, arm drag me. And I just, as a, as a night off, and then we worked and we worked. Uh, we actually done some independence together. Uh, I'll, there was a time I used to, we worked up in Cleveland for all, the Cleveland All-Star Wrestling uh, for a dear friend of mine's departed, JT Lightning. But uh, Tommy and I do like a three-day loop up there. And it got to where after the first couple, I just go, I drove and he'd fly in. And I'd pick him up to the airport. And the first stop is you got to go to the package store, you know, get us, get a case of beer right off the bat, you know, and we just start our weekend and we just work through it the whole weekend. And, um, uh, Tommy's just Tommy, man. Um, the, he in Smoky Mountain was easy. Like I said, on Independence, he was easy. Um, I wrote a little story about it in one of my books there where um, they gave us the hotel was the Marriott down by the uh, airport, like $90. And um, instead of having it booked for us one time, they just gave us like the, the promoter up there gave us $90 each and said, this will cover your cost. And um, Tommy's like, you want to split a room and split this money? And I was like, hell yeah. So we went in, we slept ass, ass to ass. You know, I faced one way, he faced the other. <laughs> and we got $45 extra on top of our money. We split the money. So I said, every time we went back there, I said, Tommy, here's the deal. I'll pick you up at the airport and we're going to split rooms the next two nights or however long we're here. And we'll get some extra money out of it and whatever that, that cover our beer money, you know? So yeah, Tommy and I, uh, I, I had some, last time I saw him, Tommy, just Tommy. Um, we was at a memorial show or a fan fest and a memorial show. And I stayed for the fan fest part. And I just spoke to him very briefly. Tommy, he, uh, you know, he's one of, one of them guys, some people just do their own thing. And you do your own thing. And uh, I've had him on shows here uh, after Smoky Mountain shut down for like a three day run. Again, my brother and I, we talk a lot of wrestling and he was over for dinner the other night. That's why it's fresh. We were just talking about Tommy being on, on these three shows we had up here one time and uh, man, he was just over and he come out and this is this, both people were passed, but he, he, they were trying to set up a six man tag match and he come out there and he said, uh, uh, I just got off the phone with Bob Geigel and, <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, shit, Nick Goulas, and they they said this could be a six man tag match. Now, now, obviously, the only smart fans in the building were the older guys that were fans got the whole deal. But it's so funny because me as Stro and myself, and we're looking at each other, laughing behind Tommy's back, like because he's throwing out these old timers' names that's already passed away. But he had to get their approval to be a part of the six man tag, so he ribbed us during the interview. It's, you know, just fun shit. So <laughs> anyway. And uh, still beer and fried chicken, it seems like to me. He's yeah. never changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. for him. I'm going to give fried. you. I'm yep. going to give you one more name, and then we will okay. close this. Oh, damn it! I had two. Ah, uh, I'm okay. sorry. I've got one. Jimmy Del Rey. That's the penultimate one. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, I met Jimmy down in Florida when I was down there. Um, had finished, basically, still finishing training with Malenko's, but I was going to the Sportatorium and every Tuesday, and um, man, Jimmy could just fucking work, man. Uh, you could always tell he's a prankster. He was always into something. He a little bit uh, into something. It seemed like he, just, he had to keep an eye on Jimmy for some reason. But I also saw him doing TV for WWF down there, and he couldn't do the Bachlin name. The Jimmy, he was Jimmy Backlin. Yeah. He couldn't do that. He had to do whatever. And I was like, man, what the hell is he doing down here doing a job for WWF? Same thing I was, making a paycheck, you know what I'm saying? But then I'd see him work on independence around there. And, again, every Tuesday at Sport Tour, and I said, that fucking guy can go. And then uh, he came up on a um, like a Sunday afternoon show, and um, I was surprised to see him in the back. And he said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready to come up here. I'm getting ready to start next week, you know." And I knew they was looking for another heavenly body, and I was like, "Oh, that's great, Jimmy, you know." And uh, that to me, you know, he two different lifestyles, but in the ring and in the locker room is completely, you know, funny as hell. And uh, having to watch some of his matches, uh, not having to, but 
being on shows where I decided to watch every match because I love, you know, we were in some small towns in Kentucky and, you know, no TV and small crowd due to snow or whatever. And him and Tom, and he would get in there and he would do these craziest spots and make everyone, he just had people laughing their ass off and stuff, you know, uh, not that you would you something you wouldn't do in a big show or anything. And uh, easy to work with in the ring, just like, you know, he's a little bit, he, he wasn't a crazy, he wasn't afraid to take a risk when trying to move or whatever, but uh, uh, he wasn't the smoothest, but he was pretty damn smooth, you know. Mm. Um, I've heard this about a couple of different people, but it seems to uh, uh, match Jimmy. Is at, at a certain time in the evening, if you're out in the bar, and I know you were a good guy and he was a bad guy, but um, at a certain point in the, uh, in the bar, something would happen, and you just knew that was the, just the time to leave and not be anywhere yeah. like where you're going to get incriminated along with Jimmy. Yeah, I'd heard that too, but uh, like in Knoxville, uh, we had two different bars we went to and, and John C. Tennessee, the heels went to one bar, baby face, another bar. I was never around uh, Jimmy much in a bar uh, setting. And a lot of times I was already back at the hotel or uh, heading back to my home, you know, so I wasn't staying there for that particular night to go to a bar. So no, no, I've heard things, but I wasn't, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rightly wasn't there. so. Rightly yeah. so. Uh, and the very last name, Someone I don't know much about, but I'd uh, love uh, for you to talk about a bit is uh, Ron Wright. Yeah, um, you know, only, my only experience with Ron Wright, you know, professional because he was uh, managing Dirty White Boy. And he's in a wheelchair, of course, and um, he'd come out and do his promos and stuff. But, man, the fucking guys like the, you know, the, the hillbilly, the original hillbilly, just one of them guys that, you know, could get that fans riled up so good. And, of course, we're talking later on in his career, but um, – man he could just um uh for what he was doing with dirty white boy and then uh, uh renouncing the south and uh just the stuff they were doing they were getting a lot of heat man and i would have uh, the only thing i know more about ron now is just from listening to the stud cast but um when i worked with them it was just very professional um you know white boy would feed me over to him and he'd choke me or something or if i went outside the ring he'd come over with his wheelchair and give me the gimmick or something but again very professional um felt um uh, felt honored that I was involved with something because I, I knew his stories before I'd heard about him before and stuff. But, uh, but again, limit, limited action uh, with him, other professional, not like we went out to a club together afterwards <laughs> or, or going to the gym together, you know? So, yeah. but um, yeah, a lot of stories about Ron Wright, man. Yeah. Well, you'd have to push him around in the wheelchair as well. I expect so. Yeah. It's the best thing yeah. you didn't go to a club with him. Right. 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 <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, I'm going to, I, we, we've spoke for ages. Uh, I'll say it again. I actually said on the podcast, one of the best podcasts ever. And do you know, I said, right. that, I said that with Dr. Tom and I said that with Ricky. I've just had a run of just tons of fun. It seems everyone in the Smoky Mountain Territory just cool. just knows how to tell a story and just and just be fun. So I'm so <laughs> pleased you've come on. And uh, I, as, I, as I said, I'll do right by you. I will get so many clips out there. I'll get your book out there. Uh, but instead of me doing the, uh, doing the plugs, please plug away. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, man. So, yeah, the only social media I have, follow me on Twitter. I'm at BobbyBlaze744. Uh, I, I, I'm big on Twitter. That's what my, my number one go-to is on Insta, on social media. Um, I have a podcast that comes out every Tuesday morning. It's called The Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. Uh, Professor Jeremy Vilmer is my co-host on that. We just done a big tribute to uh, Paul Orndorff, and our most recent one uh, comes out today, which I know will be a different time frame but uh we're doing one on the top five eras a e r a s not e r r o <laughs> eras uh in wrestling uh we just we broke down you know the golden age and and it's just an old school podcast but again that's bell to bell bobby blaze but my main deal is man, my books i've got a couple books out and i'm working on a third book all my books can be found on amazon at bobby blaze uh smedley under that but um if you um if you want, I got Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boostable Travel. That's available in a, a, a print edition as well as ebook. And also, I have a book called, uh, my second book is called I Kicked Out on Two The Educational Wrestler. Um, I can give you some links to those. And that is if you go to tinyrl.com slash blazebook one, that'll take you to Pin Me, Pay Me. Again, you can just go directly to Amazon or you can go to uh, tinyrl.com slash blaze book two. And that'll take you to, uh, I kicked out on two. Um, the, like I said, Bobby blaze 744 on Twitter. 
um, the podcast. I've got a couple other books out there. I will tell you, if you want a really good short story, I've got three short stories. The one involved in wrestling is called Yard Time. It's Yard Time in a Big House. It's about the show we did in a federal penitentiary. Uh, had five big matches. Uh, really good story. I think it's only two ninety nine on ebook only. But save yourself the the money just saying that is enclosed inside of the second book. Uh, I kicked out on to the education wrestler, just saying you can save a couple of dollars. If you want a single story to get an idea, my writing style, et cetera. But, uh, I really appreciate people that visit my Amazon site. Also, I love feedback on Twitter, man. Um, I appreciate that very much. And I want to say, I have been looking forward to being on this podcast. I really dig what you're doing, James. And, um, I keep it up, man. I wish you the best of luck in your future, man. This this is a good stuff man yeah do you know what i, I totally appreciate I, I hugely appreciate it because i said this before it's like i forget that people watch this do you know what <laughs> i mean i'm just i'm here yeah. for a chat and, and it's a bit of a hobby thing but i mean i occasionally people write to me and say oh all the news website wrestling news websites have picked up on a video you made and it's like what have they <laughs> just like you know i'm sort of in my own little bubble and then i leave and then i do my real job and then you know it's so yeah. it's, but it, but it's so nice that people are actually watching and you know the kind words are enormously appreciated uh you don't need to give the links i'll put the links in the description I cool. uh, and you know how i do it you've seen other videos haven't you yeah. of how i do it yes. and you know put it right yes, on the screen and everything uh so i'll do the close out now i'm not going to edit any of that out and you, you just if you've made it this far in the interview you can deal with it so i'm going to say thank you there very you much <laughs> i'm going to say thank you very much for watching um i don't know who's going to be on the week after next i never know who's going to be on uh thank you bobby i mean we've done like three hours so like it's <laughs> and now it's like it's bobby's lunch time it's my dinner yeah. time He's got a bad back. I've got, a, I've got bad <laughs> everything else. Uh, but, you know, thank you so much uh, for spending so much time with me and we'll catch you again next week. Cheers. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.